Show with your host, Andrew Wheelock. Special guest today is Dr. Aaron Weiner. everybody. Welcome to the Coffee with a Geek show. This is uh, almost August, we'll say, of 2024. With me, as always, is a fantastic guest. And really, I'm going to kind of walk away from my, my ed tech hat, per se, and dig into something that's um, certainly a topic that's I don't want to say near and dear to my heart because it sounds like that's a that's a positive spin, but it's it's something that I'm uh, concerned about as a parent and certainly as an educator, and that is the issue of addiction and also just uh, with the ever increasing use of marijuana. I would like to dig into just how that affects teenagers, students, and education in general. So with me is uh, Dr. Aaron. Weiner, who is a board certified psychologist and addiction specialist, and he speaks nationally and has has a lot of background that I want to have him maybe introduce rather than myself and kind of dig into some questions. And again, the focus here would be on how addiction and uh, substance abuse in particular, marijuana is affecting our our students and what we can do about that. So Dr. Weiner, thank you so much for joining me. My goodness, it's it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Well, you came highly recommended from. Whoops, sorry, I'm going to probably time out here my lights light system here. But you came highly recommended from uh, Luke. You know, try to say his name right, Niferatos, uh, from the SAM organization. And I was looking for somebody again to give me more information just about addiction and and again specifically more marijuana. Uh, issues regarding uh, teens, and he recommended you and said, "Get a hold of you." And you've been so grateful to to join me. So, uh, Dr. Weiner, can you just tell me kind of your journey into this, to your, I, I guess this, your expertise into addiction, and um, uh, just give me your journey for your your career and everything. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a licensed clinical psychologist by training, and uh, I became more interested in addiction as I went through my process of getting my degree, in part because what I found was that there's uh, th there's an amount of education that is so important for folks who are caught in an addictive cycle, because a lot of times you're just trying to solve a problem with the substance, whether or not it's the problem is a social problem, you're trying to fit in with a group of folks, or an emotional problem, like say you're trying to deal with anxiety, you're trying to deal with depression, you're dealing with past trauma, or even for some people earlier on in the process, it might just be more about boredom. But with addiction, what starts to sink in is that you, you've got this chemical draw. There's like a chemical hook that once that gets into you, the way you start thinking about it and relating to it starts to shift. And I personally I became a psychologist in order to try to help folks learn more about their inner world and then how to shape that to achieve more of what they want to achieve in life. And what I saw with addictive substances and certainly THC, marijuana, chief among them, particularly right now, is that there are companies trying to sell you addiction where people aren't trying to sell you depression. They're not trying to sell you anxiety or trauma. People are literally trying to sell you addictive processes. And what that means then is the more people who struggle with this, the more money those companies make. And that creates a very uh, per perverse sort of incentive system in our, in our society where we've got these, you know, we can call them say like vice industries, whether or not you're talking about tobacco or THC, alcohol, gambling, even where the, the folks who are, are pushing them make more money, the more problems that are created along the way. And so I thought it was so important that people actually understand what these paradigms are, understand what these substances do to the brain and body so that they can make informed decisions. Because it's not to say, of course, that the substances themselves are going to destroy the lives of everybody they touch. That would be ridiculous, but there are risks about them that I think a lot of people don't understand. And for you to be able to make informed choices about your health, you need to understand those things, not just necessarily what you see in your social media feed or the advertising that you see. With the 
kind of um, loosening, shall we say, of, of marijuana in particular, the laws, a lot of states are allowing recreational use. Is the research showing that that's that younger teens are starting earlier? It's a really interesting question. So I'll give you a two part answer. What the research is definitely showing is that for young adult demographics, pretty much there's there's zero data point in the other direction that I'm aware of. So 18 to 25, use is going up. We're seeing historic highs in terms of that demographic. And to be honest with you, across the board, which which makes sense, right? You've created a new industry that's trying to create more people who use their product. So that, that makes a ton of sense. What is interesting about youth, what we're seeing so far is that we're tending to see actually that in areas around dispensaries, we're seeing increases in use, but not universally across the board. So there've been a few studies, this came up a lot with this question of uh, local control. A lot of times when a state uh, creates a, a recreational program, they give local jurisdictions the decision about whether or not you want to sell it within your jurisdiction. And what's very interesting is that when you look, and there's been a few studies now that show this, within about a four mile radius around a dispensary, we see a very clear impact on youth behavior. Outside of that, not necessarily as much. So it's it's a little bit more complex when we get to the, uh, the under 18 crowd in particular. Uh, but we are still seeing that when they're they're exposed to ads, when it's in their purview, uh, that it's uh, that we are seeing that increase. Quick last note: I know I'm rambling a little bit, so thanks for bearing That's with good. me. We were looking at data from the Illinois Youth Survey from 2023. I believe this data was from uh, maybe 2022. But uh, for for a presentation I was giving, I was looking at the data for alcohol versus marijuana. And one of the most interesting aspects about this was that one of the questions asked was, how easy is it for you to get this from a retail source? And kids were indicating it was twice as easy for them to get retail marijuana as it was to get alcohol from a retail source, which to me speaks to just the, the issue about creating these access points. Right now, there are sanctioned places where, say, someone with an ID or you with a fake ID could go in, you could purchase something, where before that wasn't available. And, and to me, it just that side-by-side, -side, ask the kids, how easy is it for you to get these substances from retail? Well, they're telling us, right? This is absolutely an access point. So let's dig a little deeper into just teens. What What is the research on uh, young teenage users? and uh, I'm assuming, again, from the reading I've done, that it's going to set up the brain in a different way. It's going to really have some impacts on learning as well as development. Can you talk a little bit about that research? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, well so one of the, the, the most harmful elements about all of this is that this is a product that tends to be used by young people. And young people are the population where it can do the greatest amount of harm. And this, by the way, in terms of substances impacting the brain in negative ways, it's not exclusive to THC. We see this with alcohol. We see this with nicotine. Each one does something a little bit different in terms of what the risks are. But, but youth in particular are where we need to pay the most attention. Now, what impact it has, you know, we could, we could talk about this for, for quite some time. But I would say that if we were going to break it down into a couple of categories that I know concern me the most... Now, I'll go with three. One is just straight up addiction and addictive processes. And what does it look like when you start developing a physiological addiction to a substance, generally speaking, for coping purposes? But that's that's one. The second would be just mental health and the fact that we see very concerning associations with youth mental health and THC use around depression, anxiety, suicidality, and also psychosis. And the third one would be intellectual development and brain development, just cognitive abilities, essentially, was going on there. And that we've seen numerous studies now that show that both structurally, so the shape of the brain, and functionally, when you put THC into the developing mind, it can have a lasting impact. I want to underscore here, it's not to say that there's no risk for folks who are older, particularly, again, in the addiction side of the street, that is always there. But we are definitely seeing that ages 25 and up individuals who use the substance have a much lower risk profile than those under the age of 25 in terms of those developmental attributes because under 25 our brain is not fully done developing yet um mental illnesses are there proven kind of mental illnesses that maybe um get exposed genetically or um can you just talk about mental illness and, and marijuana use? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, so so a lot of times young people will move towards THC and other substances because they are trying to cope with some underlying mental illness that's already there. And the reason why people will use this, these substances is because for many of them, at least in the beginning, it does create a sense of euphoria, right? People wouldn't use any drug, alcohol inclusive, if it didn't do anything for them. And so a lot of times it feels like it's a net positive, it's helping them. They can forget their problems, they can numb out, they can escape, they can feel some sense of euphoria. That's, that's the goal. The problem is that as time passes, as it becomes part of someone's normal way of coping with their problems, which is for addictive substances where it goes for many young people, it actually starts to have the opposite effect. And we start to find the more people are using this substance, the worse they feel, the more depression they feel, uh, statistically speaking, the more likely they are to have suicidal ideations and impulses, the more likely they are to have anxiety. And the reason for that, and again, this goes for many addictive substances, is that you stop necessarily feeling good. It's almost like fighting to achieve baseline. And when you don't have it, then you feel even worse than when you started. So you're almost just trying to feel okay, not necessarily feel feel better. And that's part of why you know, like alcohol is not an FDA approved medication for depression or anxiety. That's why THC is not an FDA approved medication for depression or anxiety, uh, because it doesn't actually help, particularly in the long run. If anything, it's actually counterproductive. Do you feel I would kind of put you um, like Luke kind of on the front lines of uh, policy prescriptions or uh, advocacy? And I know I talked with, with Luke about this and just from the few times that I've posted about this topic and, you know, my my thoughts on it, you get hit pretty hard on social media with a lot of uh, negative, um, yeah. sometimes just name calling, to be honest with you. Um, I feel like I've developed a little stronger uh, or thicker skin, I guess, along those lines. Have you come across that, uh, that kind of backlash? For being, you know, again, I know the Sam guys, Kevin Sabat, Sabat and Luke uh, take a lot. And Luke is uh, really impresses me with how calm and, and and easy he takes it. But do you get even hit professionally uh, to your colleagues in professional circles? And how do you handle that? So that's a very interesting question. So I'll start by just validating. Yes, I've actually gotten death threats on social media because I've posted science and opinions about this topic. Wow. Um, you get called all sorts of names. And it's, again, I, there's definitely a very strong uh, element of that around THC. The same things happened actually with alcohol as well. I mean, think about, there was there were murmurs about how, uh, th that like Canada, we're thinking of indicating to the population that actually no amount of drinking is safe for your health. And people are like, oh, like they're coming to take away your alcohol. It's whenever, whenever people feel like their substance is threatened, regardless of what the data says, because a lot of times that's what this is about. We're talking about being the messenger for public health and science. If people don't want to hear what you have to say, they can get very intense about it. Um, I will say, however, that professionally, it hasn't been nearly so bad. I think that people who understand the way science works, and even who have differences of opinion about it, they don't get to be quite so angry. And, you know, people disagree about science all the time, or you have, you know, studies that are coming out, and you've got mixed evidence about certain things. Uh, it's part of why, actually, I only post on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn, on social media. I've, I've left the other platforms, particularly you know, Twitter, now X. These people are vicious and mean and aggressive, and it's not what I'm there for. You know, uh, it's, you know, I'm there to talk about science and to share opinions and have thoughtful discussions. But yeah, I mean, it can be very, uh, it can be very intense, but I think it's important to keep talking about issues that you think are important and citing data and allowing people to make their own decisions. Because kind of like what I alluded to, and I know, you know, Luke, de definitely a friend. I know, you know fighting the good fight. He just recently published a, a really insightful article uh, about how uh, Philip Morris is opening a uh, plant to create nicotine pouches in his hometown of Aurora, Colorado. And he is not a fan. And I think many of us in public health aren't uh, a fan of $600 million being spent to create more uh, nicotine addiction, essentially is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really, I think, it, it's very easy for folks to hear like, oh, you're, you're going after our pet drug or the thing that we care a lot about or politically or uh 
economically what we want to succeed. Whereas, you know, I make no bones about the fact that I have issues, honestly, with uh, our some aspects of alcohol policy, THC policy, nicotine, gambling. Each political party seems to have their own substances and behaviors that they support and others that they malign. And I think it's so critical just to ally yourself with public health and with science and to be out there and, uh, you know, and, and, and to trust that it'll be okay. And we live in a society where that won't, you know, like it's one thing to actually have, like say an attempt on your life versus actually, you know, someone saying things, people say a lot of things online. Um, it's the, it's just the environment. Do you get into kind of the policy game? Cause I know, uh, there's currently a lot of, uh, chatter about rescheduling marijuana. Um, mm -hmm. do you have opinions on that? Do you weigh in on that or? Uh, yeah, I, I did. Uh, I, I posted actually an article on LinkedIn about why I, I don't think it makes sense uh, if you actually look at the data. And even if you read the DOJ's report, they were basically saying, we think that the DEA's, uh, the DEA's qualification, like what it takes, the criteria for being Schedule 3, I believe their words were, quote unquote, impermissibly narrow. So we're going to put it there because we think it belongs there, even though it doesn't meet the criteria because it's impermissibly narrow. And my two cents about it, and again, happy to dive deeper into this, is more that it's if we're going to have a system, like a scheduling system, we actually need to, to play by the rules we have and, and not make exceptions because for whatever reason, we think that a certain substance should be an exception. I think that there are great critiques on the scheduling system and that it might be due for to be reformed. And then we should do that, you know, and, and reform the scheduling system to be in line with what we need our tiers and classifications to be. But I don't think making exceptions or workarounds for certain substances that we like for one reason or another uh, is necessarily, and then undermining the rules essentially is the way to go about doing that. And that's not, uh, again, I, if someone were just trying to do that with another drug, I would say the same thing. I, I think that's part of where the debate gets pretty hot is people are like, oh, you're, you're demonizing, you're villainizing THC. It's no, I, I actually just believe in the FDA. I believe in the DEA. I think that if we have rules and systems and institutions, we should do it the right way and not try to circumvent them because we want something right now, or we want something because it, it's advantageous to us politically or economically. Um, I like that answer. And I agree with it. Um, let me kind of come back to schools though, because I know uh, one of the issues in, in many of the schools that I've been around in and chatted with, with principals and teachers is the issue of vaping. And I always just assumed originally that vaping was just a, uh, you know, nicotine thing and kind of a cool thing. But it, it, if I'm not mistaken, THC is also being vaped. And what are your, what have you heard as far as, you know, prevention? And I, I know we even have schools that have um, detectors that can detect, uh, you know, vape in the, in the restrooms mm -hmm. and that's thoughts on that. And, and what are you seeing trends, um, solutions? Yeah. Well, so vaping, that's a really interesting construct because it's a delivery system, right? You can deliver nicotine, you can deliver THC. And part of the concern about vaping is that it looks, if we start with the THC side of the tracks, it allows you to deliver the most harmful formulation of THC in a much easier way. So the potency of the products that you vape are a lot stronger even than today's flower, the marijuana that you would say smoke. Uh, and that's even stronger than it used to be. Marijuana used to be like 3 to 4% THC. Now it's about 30%. And vapes tend to be, I'd say, minimum 65% and you can buy them very commonly 75, 85, 90% pure. And what the issue is that we're seeing is that the more potent the product, the greater the chance for harm is what we're seeing across a number of different studies. And so what you have with vapes is, the, is a very trendy now for young people delivery system to take the most harmful way to consume this product and put it into your body. There was just a study that came out recently that found that I alluded to psychosis earlier. There was a study that was finding for cannabinoid-induced psychosis, your chances of it, of it happening to you are 11 times greater if you're using products when you are under the age of 20. And when we think again about who's vaping, it's predominantly young folks. That's the, the, those are the folks who are doing it. 
And additionally, when you look at the rates of psychosis by product, there was a uh, there was a very large study that came out of Europe about five years back. What they found was that your chances of having a break are about 50% higher if you're smoking it and five times higher, five, 500% higher if you are vaping it. And so the issue with vaping is that it, again, takes something like using concentrates that used to be very challenging just logistically, makes it very easy, makes it trendy for young people. And on the nicotine side, which again, I know isn't our main focus today, but just to touch there for a second, the issue with vaping, well, there, there's a few, but the main one is that you take away a lot of the aversive element of nicotine consumption and you make it uh, stronger and more palatable. So for people who smoke, one of the primary ways you help them quit is you have them be very mindful of the taste because cigarettes taste awful. Almost no one likes, even smokers, almost no one likes the taste of cigarettes. And so what happens though with vapes is you take that taste away, you replace it with something fruity or sweet, minty, and actually you have an even stronger nicotine hit from a vape than you do from a cigarette. So you get more of the addictive nicotine hit. You take away the caustic uh, mouth and throat feel, you take away the flavor that's so terrible, you replace it with something positive. And it creates this trap. Not only that, but you can buy vapes that have 20,000, I think even sometimes more than that, puffs in them. And there's no break points. Like when you're smoking, you can't really do it very easily indoors unless you want the, the you know, to, the smoke and the, the odor and all that to stain everything. Uh, you, you also have individual units, right, of cigarettes, which yes, you can chain smoke, but there's at least a potential end there. With vaping, people take it everywhere. They do it inside. They take it to bed with them at night. They're, you know, I've heard stories of people clutching it, like they hold it all night long. Uh, it, it just never has to end. And so it creates, although there are fewer toxins in nicotine vapes than in cigarettes, that part is true, and there's no tar, there are still thousands, this has been confirmed, thousands of chemicals, many of them tar carcinogenic and toxic, in vape aerosol, what you take into your lungs. And you can do it anywhere for longer periods of time. So it's, uh, again, I, I know I'm rambling a little bit. No. There's just a lot, so, so much to say, but it creates a problem. I guess last kind of big question here, and again, it's a predictive one, so it's often challenging, but there's a lot of money behind uh, the big uh, marijuana uh, movement, I think it's safe to say. And I think that money has influenced a lot of uh, reputable news outlets that have pretty much gone pro-legalization, or at least in recent, you know, probably before every a lot of these places have legalized and kind of seen for themselves the the damaging uh, circumstances. But how do we counter all of this? I mean, money is, is it's hard to, you know, certainly money is, and, and Luke and again, Kevin have been doing a lot of work along those lines as well as, uh, as others. Aubrey Adams comes to mind from um, Every Brain Matters organization. Um, how does this end? What What's your predictive future of where we go? Do you think the tide is turning? Because I do sense there's a tide that's turning. And I, again, uh, tip my hat to you and to, again, the org organizations that I've mentioned, Sam and Every Brain Matters, and there's a Parent Action Network. Do you, do you sense that tide is turning? And do you think, again, as people are kind of seeing the results of this kind of reduced, relaxed uh, attitude? Uh, towards marijuana that we can maybe make some headway in the other direction? Yeah. So I, that's a really good question. I, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I, when I think about the future, I look to the past a little bit, right? And I think that if you look at the arcs of other chemicals and other industries, there are some that have persisted for a long period of time, like take alcohol. Can I mention that for example? Like alcohol, just as a quick note, they are alcohol kills far more people than opioids do in our country, but we don't talk about an alcohol epidemic. Alcohol right now is killing every year about 140 to 180,000 people. Uh, opioids, I, I think they have hit, uh, or they're, they're around 100,000, maybe less. Uh, all, op all overdoses, I think, are about 112 right now. I think opioids might be like 80 or 90. We don't talk about alcohol, and there's a lot of reasons for that. But then you take, for example, smoking cigarettes, where that peaked, and then there's been a downturn. And now smoking is at its lowest rate in a long time. This was far before the advent of vaping, right? There was, there was a pivot point there. And a lot of that had to do with social trends and the way the public viewed it. Even if you look at uh, vaping, 
for example, there was this exponential growth for a while, and then a combination of public perception as well as actually policy has started to shift the way that that's worked, particularly for teens, where now we're not seeing that huge growth that we were in the early days of Juul with, you know, with, with all the marketing towards young people. There's been a lot. So when I think, though, about THC, I, I, I legitimately don't know. On the one hand, we do see money flowing in. We do see some pushes from some sectors to grow the industry, to grow the market, to make it bigger. I think, though, that ultimately... The, the, the truth eventually comes out about how all of this works. Stories start to compile. There's still this myth, for example, a lot of people honestly believe that THC isn't physically addictive. And it is. Absolutely it is. The second most common substance we treat in drug rehab programs nationally after alcohol. And yet there's this myth that it's not addictive. And I think as time passes, I, I don't know if it, you know, how large it will need to grow before people actually start to catch on about this and say, wait a second, maybe we shouldn't be allowing, you know, billboards to be plastered all along the roads. Maybe we shouldn't be making like, like they are in Illinois, where I'm from. You know, like maybe we should be applying the same principles, for example, like we, you know, Tobacco 21, right, is all about reducing access to youth to tobacco, right? Less access means less use. But I think at a certain point, we're going to realize that more people being high on THC is not a value add and we shouldn't be promoting it. Doesn't necessarily mean that there's a lot of, and Luke and, and, and Kevin and Sam talk about this a lot, there's this false dichotomy that either you're saying we're gonna throw people in jail for using, or we're gonna have this capitalistic free-for-all, where it's just like how many people can we get to buy this product? And I think that the answer about what actually leads to the best public health outcome lies somewhere in between. And I think the, you know, the, the story has yet to be written on how far the pendulum is going to need to swing in the for-profit, the addiction for-profit side of things. And we start to see consequences before it swings back. Just like one example, and it can swing back in certain cases. I, I look at what happened in Oregon, where they, where they really went very hard towards we're not going to have any consequences for public use of drugs, for you know, possession of anything. And, and what they found was that that actually the program as it was created did not work for them. It didn't achieve the results it wanted. There was a tremendous amount of public drug use and people on the streets. And so they revised the policy. And now they've landed in the middle. And you know, we'll, we'll see where that goes. And I think on a broader scale, right, that's where sometimes society needs to go. They, they try one thing out, they find, wait a second, like where we started wasn't working for us, now where we've gone isn't working for us. Maybe we should be somewhere balanced. And I think ultimately that is where so, the solution to so many things lies, is somewhere in the middle, uh, where whoever's you know, promoting really extreme policies on either side of the fence, uh, probably not the best way to go. Again, just my, my personal bent on it. I think being in the middle is where the sweet spot is. But how long the pendulum and how far the pendulum swings, getting back to your question about THC, that I, I really couldn't tell you. But for my part, I just try to make sure that people have open eyes, right, about what they choose to put in their body, about the policies, about the advertising, about the product. And when I see research that I think needs to be promoted, I try to promote as much as I can. Wow. Uh, thank you very much, um, Aaron. This has been a great conversation. Uh, and I have to say, and again, I say this to all the people on the front lines like you, Kevin, again, Aubrey Adams, and so many that are doing this kind of work. And I know the pushback you get, again, even from my just limited kind of dipping my toes into this. Uh, I've, I've gotten some pretty harsh feedback as well. And again, I'm, but I, you're displaying courage by sticking to research-based ideas and philosophies, and I truly respect it and hope uh, good things for you and for um, the way this this plays out. And uh, just keep up the good work is is my best uh, advice and hope for you. And again, I appreciate you coming and talk to me, and I hope uh, we can keep the conversation going. Um, do you have a moment for a quick fun question so we can have a little ed tech fun? I like to leave off on a, a fun note or at least something not so heavy. Um, so some, yeah. do you have a cup? Let me just see if I can get some speed geek questions up is what I call them. So let's, let's see roll. what would be a good one. So what's your, uh, I'm assuming you use technology. Can I safely assume that? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so, for sure. 
Okay, so what's your favorite app? Let's start there on an easy one. Oh, my favorite app. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, honestly, I, again, I mentioned it earlier. I think it's LinkedIn. I learned so much on there. I love the community on there. That's going to be my, my favorite app. That's a good one. You know, and it's one that I don't spend a lot of time looking at, but it is a good one. It's much more positive, much more professional, and probably better for your mental health, right? <laughs> Let me give you a second one too, actually, yeah. if we want to stay away from social media sure. for a second. Uh, I love to meditate. I do it every day. It's really changed my life for the better. My favorite meditation app is called 10% Happier. And if you actually oh. want to dive deep into learning it in a science-based way, can't do better than that one. It's All fantastic. right. I like it. Uh, what's a tech trend to watch out for? I mean, I'm assuming AI is your most obvious one, but uh, and and you can use that one if you'd like, but... What do you think? So you mean like in a negative direction or a positive? Uh, it direction? could be either. It could be either. What's a what's a trend that you see coming down the the way? All right. Well, I'm going to piggyback. So I'm going to take AI and broaden it out a little bit. So I am very excited about AI, but also then mobile app applications for mental health. There's a fantastic. Uh, there's a really cool study that was done where someone was trying to reduce the amount of opioids that folks took and chronic pain, and they did it by delivering informational, uh, basically an educational intervention over Zoom. So, you know, it was masked, right? So it was, it was, it was recorded, but then also they passively monitored folks' vitals from their Apple watch. And when it, they could tell that they were in pain based on their heart rate and their physiological tension, it gave them a buzz and said, Hey, why don't you practice one of those relaxation techniques that we talked about before you take a pill? And it was found actually that it was highly effective in terms of helping folks take fewer pills and be in less pain by utilizing tech to help people with their physical and mental health. I also think that in terms of workforce shortage issues for therapists, there's such a workforce shortage. We need to start leveraging technology to reach people with low and moderate acuity problems to see what we can resolve before they have to talk to a therapist. And I think that AI is going to be critical. I think that your people's phones and what we can deliver through them is going to be absolutely essential. So I'd keep, keep eye on that and watch for the good ones. Cause I think that'll be crucial to honestly, <laughs> this can sound like an overstatement, but civilizations, I think mental health is one of the defining issues of our time. And I think that we've got to be able to take that into our own hands. And I think technology is going to be part of how we do that. Great. Well, we'll end on that one. Thank you so much. And again, much respect and appreciation for all you do. Keep up oh, the great my work. My pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity to come. All right.